name is Ian Hamilton and I am an accessibility specialist. So I work with various areas of the industry to um, raise awareness and try and push the bar a bit higher for accessibility for people with disabilities. So I started out in like design UX. Um, when I first got involved with accessibility was when I was working on um, kids games. This is like CBeebies stuff, um, like Teletubbies, that kind of thing. Mm. And um, I actually saw some playtesting footage of games that had been adapted to work with a single key press for the controls. Right. And the reason for doing that is because if you've got one single input control, digital input, that can then map to hardware devices that work on the same basis, mm. which is basically the same kind of kit that Stephen Hawking uses. Right. So it can be any a wide range of things. It could be blowing into a tube. It could be an infrared blink detector. Quite a common one is like a single button on a wheelchair headrest. Right. So it's for people who can't use any kind of traditional input devices. And um, when I was at school myself, I had done an exchange program with a special needs school. Mm. And I'd seen young kids with that kind of level of motor impairment who are basically just kind of lying in the back of the classroom, passively being careful, listening to lesson. Right. And through this playtesting footage, I was seeing these preschool kids with that kind of same level of motor ability who are now just like laughing and smiling and playing and just doing exactly the same thing that other classmates were doing. So they kind of opened my eyes to, you know, up, up to that point, a success for me working on a game would be to entertain someone to hopefully, you know, affect their emotions a bit. And then actually seeing the power that games have, what games really are, what they can do, there wasn't really any kind of going back from there. That's the thing what people often don't realise is that games aren't just, you know, a bit of fun. The access that they give you to recreation, to culture, to socialising is stuff that a lot of people take for granted. But if for some reason your means of accessing those things is restricted, then actually games can be a really powerful contributor right. to your quality of life. So, you know, for example, if you, if you can't just like go out and meet your friends and socialise, you can still have a really good meaningful social life in a virtual world. So this year you uh, started a conference uh, on Monday. It's the first time you've ever done one. Uh, tell me how, you know, you're sort of two days off from it now. Uh, what was the whole um, impetus of doing it around GDC specifically? And also, like, how do you feel how it went? Yeah, well, the, the reason for doing it was basically because it's, um, it's kind of reaching tipping point now where there's um, so, so many developers who actually know about this stuff and want to do something about it. And have been starting to do some really interesting stuff. So, you know, compared to previous years when it was all about just trying to raise awareness, let people know that accessibility exists, that's a thing. There's, there's enough people doing nice, good stuff now that it felt like a good opportunity to bring those people together and share some experiences and spread some knowledge around and help kind of take things up to the next level. A nice range of attendees as well, because mm. in previous years when there have been accessibility sessions at conferences, it's largely been students and indies. And actually the majority of the people at this conference were AAAs, right. which is quite a big shift just specifically in the last year. And I think actually Uncharted um, has a lot to do with that. Um, Uncharted has been a really, really powerful example um, because it basically it implemented the range of accessibility features for motor accessibility, so mm. to allow people to play with one hand. Um, you know, if you can't button mash, you've got the option to switch quick time events to just holding down the button instead. Um, but what's really significant is the fact just that it is Uncharted that's done this stuff. Right. So first off, busting misconceptions that people have that you know accessibility is going to dilute your ideas down, it's going to make it less fun for everybody else just by serving this niche audience. But you now, if you look at Uncharted, you can't really get stronger evidence right. that that misconception is just a misconception, you know. Look at, look at sales figs, it's Metacritic, it's critical reception, you know. But also, um, just because it is such a big, high-profile game, it's one that other developers notice. Mm. And we saw that previously with um, colour blindness, because colour blindness in games is something that's kind of approaching a standard consideration. Yeah. It was only in 2014, in like two and a half years ago, that if a single game considered colour blindness, that was big front-page news. Mm. And it just took those first few games, um, Black Ops 2 and um, Borderlands 2 and SimCity, like those three games, mm. they got loads of press for considering colour blindness. And then all of a sudden people start to know about it. People start to think about themselves. So that's already been happening with Uncharted as well. For a lot of people, when you talk about topics like this, it sort of falls underneath a sort of a banner of like charitable interest or something. But really, this is just a UX problem. It is, it is. This is a problem that if it affected more people, would be have been solved. It's like it's like the idea of you know, yeah, like you said, altruism. Like the idea of like putting a ramp outside of a building is like some in some way altruistic. Whereas actually, it's not really. It's just that we've designed so many systems within our culture to. Well, that's a nice example because if you put a ramp outside of a building, you can get business from those wheelchair customers that you wouldn't have had had before. Right. It's the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of kind of thing with gaming. It's not just about the you know. Obviously, it's a really good thing to do. It really helps people. Like I said, the quality of life, all those kind of arguments, but. 
those numbers I'm talking about, this is a big market. Right. And even just, just anecdotally, things that, that you hear, like someone who um, abandons like Call of Duty in favour of Gears of War because um, Gears of War, the team colours are orange and blue and it worked with their colour blindness. Right. You know? um, but you even see it in data as well. So um, one thing that you can, you can actually accurately track data on accessibility for is people who are blind. Right. Basically, the mm. way that blind people use technology is usually through a screen reader, which is a bit of software that speaks out text via a synthesized voice. And then on iOS, it works really nicely because of the touch screen, which you wouldn't necessarily think, you know, no. touch screen is something to give people a blind. But basically, you just switch it on. And this is it's on Android, on Windows phones, all mobile devices. You turn it on, and it changes how gestures work on the phone. So everything you would normally do with one finger, you now do with two fingers. Right. That frees up one finger, so you can just run your finger over the surface of the screen, and it speaks out the text label of whatever element ah. your finger is over. So you can basically use your finger like an eye and visualize the layout of the screen. Mm. Um, it doesn't yet work with game engines, because game engines don't output any interface elements. They output a bunch of pixels. Hopefully that'll change. But for games that are developed natively, um, it works. It just works. And with really minimal effort, um, one example being Hanging with Friends, which mm. is the full on for, with, from Words with Friends. Their game um, is really popular with blind gamers because it allows them to play with sighted gamers, like keep in touch with family members and stuff through gaming. Really right. nice stuff, right? Their game's blind accessible. They found out it was blind accessible when CNN ran a story about it. You're so kidding. It just worked. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because they just use, just, just use sensible names for interface elements. One thing I'd really, really love to see progress on is subtitling. Right. So subtitling is present in, I'm not going to say all, but present in nearly all games, but it's terrible mm. in all of them. And it's really, really basic stuff, like mm. just being able to read it against the background. Um, right. I mean, some things with timing, like giving away plot points too early, but most of it is just like have subtitles that you can actually read, mm. especially that you can read from sitting on a couch, you know, making sure there's decent contrast against the background, making sure that they're a decent size, you know, really, really basic stuff. And it's things that other industries have already cracked. You know, right. this is not an R&D job. If you look at like TV, movies and stuff, there's already really good established standards for how mm. to design them. And we're now starting to see the first few companies start to implement this kind of stuff. Well, a really key thing is um, allowing them to be customized. Mm. So you've got different use cases. You might have someone who is um, completely deaf, who needs to read every single word. He needs them to be like as large and clear as possible. Mm. Someone who's dyslexic, who needs to have really like solid background behind it. Right. So the game's visuals don't interfere with the letter shapes. You might have someone who only has subtitles on because occasionally in the game mix, an explosion will go off during the important moment of plot. So mm. they want them just to be really subtle and out of the way and just glance at them occasionally. All those people have different needs. But you don't have to try and do one size fits all. You can just give a couple of options. Right. Like that black box, like allow people to turn it off and on, off and on. So easy. As far as I'm aware, there's one game that's ever done that, really? which is Life is Strange. It's, it's crazy. Like So much of this stuff seems to be like, if not like easy, like not, not overly difficult to implement. It's yeah. just that people aren't aware of it, is it? Or yeah. is it? That's right. So people are becoming aware. Um, but what we're still seeing at the moment is people coming aware mid-development right. when it's difficult to do things. Yeah. And that's the big, big thing with accessibility is you need to think about it at the start. Um, like, for example, text size. So text size is one of the most common accessibility complaints in games. So there's, 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 there's recommended minimum text sizes, mm. like 32 pixels at 1080p. If, when you're starting to design your interface, you decide you want 32 pixels, that costs nothing. Right. That's just the design decision. If, at the end of development, as happened with The Witcher, they get feedback that text size is too small and have to go back and change it, mm. that is hugely difficult and hugely expensive. I mean, hats off to Witcher, they jumped straight on it mm. when it came out, but it's, it's really difficult and expensive. So we're still at that stage where a lot of studios, like, um, I mean, even with Naughty Dog, they came to it quite late in development, so they're limited in what they're able to do, mm. but now they're aware, so when they start their next game, they'll be able to do much, much more. Right. And hopefully that's going to be the stage we get to next. Just becomes part of the process. Exactly. People will have um, different unique requirements, um, but there is a general approach, well, two really. One is avoiding un unnecessary complexity. Right. You know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you've got a control that has 28 buttons on it doesn't mean you need to use all of them. Um, but just offer people some flexibility, you know? So if you take, like, you know, con a console controller is quite a complicated interface compared to, you know, like a mouse or something. There's a lot of different ways that that can be inaccessible to different people. Like someone might have to operate a controller on their lap and not be able to curve their fingers around mm. to reach the trigger buttons. Someone else might not have enough strength to click in 
the triggers. You know, this is all different, but if you just allow people a bit of flexibility, allow people to remap the controls, mm. and, but that kind of stuff, obviously remapping is stuff that so many players want. Players who just disagree with the designers' decisions about what the controls should be. Mm. And that's what you find a lot with this kind of stuff, um, is that it is just, just wide-ranging things because you're just looking at removing a barrier, and it's quite rare for a barrier to be something that is a problem for one niche group. It's normally like a big problem for one group, but still is like a bit of an annoyance for everybody else. Right. Another nice example, which is on, on that same topic of motor, but on mobile devices, is um, a game called Into the Dead. And the um, designers, when they're designing it, you know, they considered all different kind of control schemes, and they went for a gyroscope. And it got to the end stages of development, right at the end, and one of the team members um, brought up the issue of accessibility. And they implemented three additional control schemes. But of course, you know, they, 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 un, they know what fun is. They knew that the, til the gyroscope would be the most popular option, yeah. and it was just altruism, right? right? They were just doing this to help, you know, there may be a couple of percentage of people who might need to use the other ones, and everyone else would choose the tilt. And then they tracked the data. Mm. And the usage data across those four different input methods was 25%, 25, 25, 25. You're kidding. So what they'd actually done, they thought this was an altruistic thing for a very, very small percentage. Yeah. They'd actually made the game better for 75% of their audience. Right. But there is, there is a bit of a barrier in that um, it, it costs time and money to do. Mm. Um, there is now the option that people can reconfigure their controls at a uh, system level, right. which is kind of okay as a safety net. It's still better to do it in-game. Yeah. So stuff like, for example, in Overwatch, where you can set up individual remapping for each different character class, mm. really, really good. So you can set up different remapping, for example, between running and driving. You might have different requirements for that. Yeah. If you can do it in-game, you can also have all the in-game um, prompts and stuff reflect the remapping. Mm. So all the tutorials and stuff still match. And that barrier of implementation costs um, is in the process of coming down because Unity have now started working on a new input model, mm. which abstracts the two things away by default. So it's basically done um, so that when new input devices are created for VR and that kind of stuff, the system's already set up to work for them. Mm. So you can map freely in between um, analog and digital. So you can remap pushing forward on a stick and the A button. Mm. You can remap between different devices. So you can take a control scheme that was designed for a controller and remap it to a mouse. So basically you just say, I want to remap what jump is. It just sits there and listens and say, what do you want? If you want to know more about the accessibility considerations you can put into games, there's a website called gameaccessibilityguidelines.com and that's got just a whole list of um, good practices, loads of examples of games that are already doing um, good things, quotes from gamers that affect all that kind of stuff. For the conference, it is gaconf.com. Um, all the sessions were recorded, and Perfect. they're going to be up on YouTube, freely available soon. Good stuff. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Pleasure.